So we are going to talk about why we can turn limits of integers into limits of real numbers. For example, let's say we're looking at the limit as n goes to infinity of the natural log of n over square root of n. One way to compute this limit is to first consider the limit as x goes to infinity of the natural log of x over the square root of x. Now these two limits are the same except that in the first case, as n goes to infinity, we're only letting n be an integer, whereas when we take the limit as x goes to infinity, we're letting x be any real number. Now the reason we want to use real numbers is that this lets us take derivatives. So we can use something like L'Hopital's rule to find out that the limit as x goes to infinity equals zero. And now that we know that the limit as x goes to infinity equals zero, that tells us that this first limit as n goes to infinity, this also equals zero. So we're able to use derivatives tricks like L'Hopital's rule to take a limit of integers. Now the reason that we can take the limit as x goes to infinity to get the answer for the limit as n goes to infinity is because of a general fact about limits, which is that if we have the limit as x goes to infinity of some function f of x being equal to some number l, this implies that the limit as n goes to infinity of that same function also equals l. Now the question is, why is this true? Because this statement right here holds for any function f, but notice that the same thing does not hold in reverse. For example, consider the limit as x goes to infinity of sine of 2 pi x. This limit does not exist, but if we look at the limit as n goes to infinity of sine of 2 pi n, well, when n is an integer, sine of 2 pi n is equal to 0. So the limit as n goes to infinity of this is just the limit of 0, which equals 0. So in this case, the limit as n goes to infinity exists, but the limit as x goes to infinity does not exist. So this implication only works from x to n. It doesn't go the other way around. To understand why the limit as x goes to infinity implies the limit as n goes to infinity, and to understand why it doesn't work the other way around, we need to remember the definition of a limit. That is the epsilon delta definition. So what it means to say that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x equals l is the following. For all numbers epsilon greater than zero, there exists some number m greater than zero, such that if x is greater than m, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So let's talk about what this definition means, starting with this last inequality at the end. The absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. First of all, the absolute value of f of x minus l what this expression really is, is it's the distance from this number f of x to the number l. For example, let's say that f of x is equal to 3 and l is equal to 5. Well, the distance from the number 3 to the number 5 is 2. And that's also the absolute value of 3 minus 5. So this difference here is telling us how far away is the function f of x from the limit value l. And this inequality is telling us that the distance from f of x to l is less than epsilon. So let's say we look at a 2D graph of our function f of x. So we're going to have f of x on the vertical axis here, and the limiting value l is going to be right here. The definition tells us that we can first pick some epsilon greater than zero. And for any value of epsilon we pick, there's going to be some number m greater than zero. And the definition says, with this m greater than zero, the property it has is that no matter what value of x we pick, if x is bigger than m, then the distance from f of x to l is less than epsilon. So we can imagine putting a boundary here around l, where this top part is l plus epsilon, the bottom part is l minus epsilon. So inside of this range, that's all the values of the function that are a distance less than epsilon away from L. And what this definition says 
is that once we pick our value of epsilon, we get this value of m, for all the values of x past this point, their distance from L has to be less than epsilon, which means they have to lie in this range right here. This is what the function is going to look like after that value of m. And this statement has to be true for all epsilon greater than zero. So if we want, we can make this range even smaller and even smaller. And every time we do that, there's going to exist some m where every value of the function lies in this little range above and below the value of L. So we can make the function as close to L as we want by picking some epsilon greater than zero for this tiny range, and then that's going to give us a value of m, where everywhere past m, the function has to be that close to the limit L. So this is what it means for the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x to equal L. Now, what does it mean for the limit as n goes to infinity of f of n to equal L? Well, the definition over here is actually almost identical to the definition in the case where x goes to infinity. The only difference is that instead of looking at an x greater than m right here, we're looking at n greater than m. And then in this inequality, we'll have the distance from f of n to L being less than epsilon. And like I said earlier, the difference between taking a value of x and a value of n is that we only allow n to be an integer. So in this case, we're letting x be any real number, but in this case n, these are only the whole numbers. So let's suppose we already know that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x equals l. And now we want to prove that the same holds for the limit as n goes to infinity. In other words, we want to prove that this epsilon delta definition holds when we're looking at n instead of at x. So let's go through the definition and see if it works. It starts by saying for all epsilon greater than zero. So we pick any value of epsilon that we want, any positive real number. And from there, the definition of the limit as x goes to infinity tells us that there exists some number m greater than zero, where this statement holds. If x is greater than m, then the distance from f of x to l is less than epsilon. Now when we look at the limit as n goes to infinity, instead of looking at x greater than m, we're looking at n greater than m, where n is an integer. But if n is an integer, then it's also a real number. So when we're looking at the limit as n goes to infinity, we get some integer n that's greater than m. But an integer greater than m, that's also a real number greater than m. And the limit as x goes to infinity tells us that if we have a real number greater than m, it has to satisfy this inequality right here. And n is a real number greater than m, which means that n is also going to satisfy that same inequality. So to prove the limit definition for n, what we do is we say, okay, given our positive real number epsilon, any epsilon we want, we choose the exact same value of m as we get from the limit as x goes to infinity. Because this limit equaling L tells us that there's always going to exist an m greater than zero for the real number version of this implication. So we take that m, the m from the real number version, and we say use that for the integer version of the definition as well. Because in the integer version, if n is greater than that value of m, then we know this inequality has to hold because n is also a real number greater than m. So ultimately, the key reason that the limit as x goes to infinity implies the limit as n goes to infinity is that every integer is also a real number. So when we look at the epsilon delta definition for integers, we can take the exact same value of m as we would use for the real number case and apply that to the integer case just as well. And this also explains why knowing the limit as n goes to infinity does not tell us the limit as x goes to infinity. The proof works this way because every integer is also a real number. But not every real number is also an integer. For example, 1.5 is a real number that's not an integer. 
So if we know that this epsilon delta definition holds for n being an integer, that doesn't tell us that it also holds for real numbers.